And if there's anything going on at your end, like if if anyone says something at your end, we can mute you. Yeah, in we can the check chat that out. We'll get separate tracks so we can mute out if you. Ah, I see. Yeah, fart or Sandra says something or whatever. There's a particularly spirited dog just having a great time. <laughs> no, yeah. I don't think it'll be that. If I sneeze, you'll be able to mute it out. Yeah, exactly. Sneeze away. Or maybe you just want to keep that. Well, let's reserve judgment until we hear the quality of the sneeze. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome to this episode of Because Language, a show about linguistics, the science of language. My name's Daniel Midgley. Let's meet the team. She's someone without whom you wouldn't want to mess with. It's Hedvig Hirgard. I'm just trying to unpack that one. Yeah, I can't. I don't. So if, what is if it we referring to? Have, if we don't have Hedvig, people will want to mess with us? Was that the implication? It's the opposite of what you think it is, even when you think it's the opposite. Oh. Daniel's just being willfully silly because we have a syntax episode once again. <laughs> Tell me why that <laughs> sentence doesn't make sense. I think what happened is you talked about Zizek jokes in the last one, and now it's just, it's, oh, it's all... <laughs> it's all on. Anyway, I'll take it. It's either that people shouldn't mess with me or that they shouldn't mess with other people without me, which both seem good for me. I think there's no wrong way to take this. It's all good. Yeah. No, thank you. I'm going to go on. Okay. Yeah. Okay. My turn. He's a man of few words to live by. It's Ben Ainsley. It's like if Is Dr. That... Zeus got drunk and if he was drunk, he was also <laughs> a talentless hack. Like if those two things were true, oh, it feels God. like he wrote this <laughs> in the introduction. By the way, his name is supposed to be Dr. Seuss. Oh. And the more you know. Mm -hmm. He even wrote a poem back in the day. Uh, You're as wrong as the deuce, and you shouldn't rejoice in pronouncing it Seuss. He pronounces it Seuss. But eventually he relented and called it Seuss, just like everybody else. Wow. Sometimes the, uh, mm -hmm. the people do the branding, and you've got nothing to do about it. Hey, good to see you two again. This is the second of a two-parter on the school of linguistic thought known as generativism. And to help us, we have two very special guest hosts. We've got Taylor Miller who is a visiting assistant professor in linguistics at the State University of New York, Oswego, and Adam Tallman. Adam is a postdoctoral researcher at Friedrich Schiller Universität Jena and research affiliate of the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology. Hello to both of you. Thank you for coming on the show. I'm really happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Excellent. Tell us a bit about your work. What do you do? So I'm really excited to be here. Um, I don't have much of a voice, so your podcast listeners uh, get to hear me um, in my gravelly jazz version of myself. Mm -hmm. I don't typically sound like I'm vocal fry walking, but here we are. So my research program has two different prongs. So I work in linguistic theory, looking at issues of wordhood and the phonology syntax interface. And I also work in language documentation and reclamation. So I often argue that understudied languages are the key and crucial test to linguistic theories, and they're often overlooked and ignored. So then we get into a situation where ideas are being recycled and there's no real scientific progress being made. So that's the kind of question that I'm, I'm working on. And I do community-based field work in the meantime to answer those questions and work in documentation and reclamation. So the two languages that I work closest with are Kiowa, a Chinoan language spoken in southwestern Oklahoma, and Soto Ojibwe, which is spoken in Manitoba. And I do field work in both communities, though I do work closer with the Kiowa community at this point because I co-lead an online dictionary project that takes place over multiple sites with a few people um, that I'm happy to talk about. And so uh, I get the honor of being included in those communities that I'm not originally a part of. They welcome me to help the language and the reclamation process. Super cool. That is so great. Do you mind just telling me a little bit about how you managed to do that, to, to find that acceptance and find that, that space in the community? <laughs> Yeah, well, it's an ongoing kind of permission, right? So 
In 2016, I did field work for my PhD thesis, and I went to both communities. I went to Carnegie, Oklahoma to be at the tribal complex for the Kiowa tribe. And then I also went up to Winnipeg and worked with community centers in the city that would have Soto speakers um, who are, are there. And I did it the exact opposite that most linguists do. So most linguists go to places where their advisor has a set relationship with the area and everybody already knows everybody. And I am apparently an overachiever and a glutton for punishment because I just went. And so I got a grant and just drove and showed up in Oklahoma, emailing like two people ahead of time, like, hey, I want to work on the language. And they were like, who's this crazy white woman from Delaware at the time showing up in Oklahoma? And I just moved in for a month in each place. So, uh, yeah, it was a little bit rough at times, but... I had there was an elder in the Kiowa tribe that said that she saw this confused white woman show up in the elder center and she just knew she needed to help her. <laughs> so um, so that was how I started forming those relationships. And I've been back to Oklahoma in the past years. Like I went back in 2019. I work with certain activists online primarily since I'm obviously not there. And with the pandemic, it's definitely not been possible to go work with elderly speakers of a language. But I have a special relationship with both communities just because of the sheer ludicrousy of me showing up and saying, hey, I want to talk yeah. about your language. What incredible kindness from those communities that, that they've shown you. That's yeah, amazing. I am forever honored, especially with the Kiowa community that they have accepted that I am going to be part of this dictionary project. Both of the co-leaders are white and not Kiowa. We're two researchers, and we were very concerned about that, especially since the community had asked for a dictionary, but we were concerned about us being two outside people being trusted with that kind of information. So, you know, sometimes the work involves like a PR campaign to make sure that everybody's okay and to give everyone an opportunity to be heard if they don't like something or if they want something in particular. And I just remind the like Kiowa language program at the tribe or um, my co-PI Amber Neely, who's a linguistic anthropologist at Kansas State. We work together just to make sure that they know that like we're going to mess up or not understand some cultural something of importance. And so just to bring it up and tell us that we're wrong and not have it be the end of the project. But I'm working on that and working with the community right up until the time that they don't want me to do it anymore. That's always the way I explain it is that while they want my help, I, I love giving it and I uh, am in love with the community. And that comes with complications of being an advocate and an ally who's outside of the community. But I love it. I wouldn't trade it for the world. That's super cool. Like the cut of your jib, Taylor. <laughs> Great. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Adam, tell us about your work. What are you doing? Um, I do what's called documentary and descriptive linguistics. It's actually, that's just what we call it at UT, but it could be called the same thing. Um, I don't think I've ever referred to it as reclamation, probably because I'm not working in North America, but um, it could also be called that. A lot of the work does uh, involve working with communities and uh, figuring out what they what they want, what type of technical help they want. Usually in the case of the Chacabo uh, and the Aro and other groups that I've worked with, it's since they still speak the language and it's fairly vital, what they don't have are educational materials in their language. So like everything that's been produced has been by missionaries. So, but they have a rich folklore. So they want that to be transcribed and translated and some training in how to use computer programs to do that themselves. At the same time, I, like Taylor, I work on the grammar. For me, documentary and descriptive linguistics, it's a field of study which sort of primarily concerned with creating documentary records of language for a variety of purposes. It can be for the community, it can be for scientific purposes, but to make those records really good and, and last for a long period of time. So I've done most of my field research in the Bolivian Amazon. Um, so in the in northern Bolivia with a Panoan language called Chacabo, uh, spoken, um, yeah, I mean, in the department of Beni, and another language called Arona, which may be distantly related. Um, it's a Tacanan language, 
spoken in the department of La Paz. And if people know about Bolivia, they might think La Paz is the Andean part, the part in the mountains, but actually a larger part of La Paz is in the Amazon. Uh, it's just very hard to get to. Um, so one mm. of the reasons people don't know much about these languages is be probably because it's hard to get to and not very accessible. I also actually did work on Soto Ojibwe too in Long Plain Reservation because I'm from Winnipeg. Um, that's what my master's was on. That's true. That's how Adam and I really know each other. That's kind of how we know each other. Oh, wow. I was like, yeah. oh, hi, you've written stuff on Soto Ojibwe. Can we be friends? <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> and you are um, friends. That's yeah. a good way to make it. Winnipeg? Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. I've also been to Winnipeg. <laughs> yeah. That's where I'm from. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. Oh. And, I, and I do... Um, you know, language comparison, because I think it helps the documentary and descriptive record. If you think about what other languages have, you go, oh, what, um, maybe, maybe these languages have this, this too, maybe I should look for that. And um, so I, I think that there's a relationship between language comparison and description and documentation, and I explore that. And those are kind of my primary research interests. That's primarily my background. Wow. Right. Well, yeah. thanks for Thank bringing you. all this expertise to our show today. Now, our last Patreon bonus episode was a Journal Club episode with me, Hedvig, and Stee, Hedvig's partner. And I guess he's approaching unofficial co-host status, is he not? Uh, he may be, uh, yeah. Fair being enough. Hedvig's partner, though, I think we should give him a say in that. Like, normally when people are on the show <laughs> like four times, we just tell them that they're a co-host and they don't really they're have a choice. But I feel like, Stee, we, we often need to, <laughs> we, need, we should be like, do you want to be? Yeah. <laughs> well, maybe. It was fun. It was a fun episode. It was a fun episode. Uh, I enjoy Journal Club a lot. I enjoy this. Is one of my, besides having lovely guests, my second favorite part of the show is uh, covering the research news. Because you're a nerd. Yes. Aren't we all? <laughs> one of us. One of us. <laughs> so if you want to hear those Journal Club episodes and a lot of other bonus episodes besides the minute they come out, then become a patron at the listener level. You can find us on patreon.com slash because lang pod. You'll put yourself in line for special rewards like hang with us on Discord, our yearly mail out, and of course, supporting the show, which gives you warm and fuzzy feels. So thanks to all of our patrons. Shall we? One of them is in this call right now, I believe. Oh. oh. Adam, Wait. is this one you want to... Oh, are you oh, yourself as a... <laughs> I, I'm, I'm a, I am a patron, but I'm not a very high-paying one, so... <laughs> Conflict of interest, cut, that's it. Cut, cut that. it all down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, cut that. Cut that if you want. Clearly, we're no better than Fox. This is just a paid puff piece. <laughs> yeah. I actually didn't know he was until... Um, <laughs> I had no idea. Uh, and, yeah, I didn't know until just the other week. Well, I was listening to one of your older episodes uh, because I, I had never heard the podcast, and I was listening to the one that you did recently about uh, like decolonizing linguistics, uh, oh, yeah. focusing on Australian languages. And I was like, oh, I like this. I'll become a patron. So it's going to happen <laughs> soon. <laughs> oh, sweet. <laughs> we'll, we'll plug your podcast. Don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. If you, you start out as a patron, then you, you end up on the show. So that's, you know, how it goes. you'd be surprised who's in our lists, who we hang out with. Once again, thanks to all of our patrons. Righto, Daniel. Enough of this shameless spruiking, you <laughs> vagabond. Let's move on to the news. So if I asked all of you lovely people who are on the call today, how many languages do you think there has ever been? Like in history, how many things that we call languages have there ever been? What would you guess? Nine. <laughs> Just well, let's maybe the... start. So Ben is our non-linguist on the show. So let's maybe start with a basic <laughs> question for Ben: nine. of How many languages there are in the world no, today? What, what just no, happened was that I... Ben Ben Googled it, and that's the answer that Google gave you: at least yeah, nine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, no, no, no. I'm going to guess. Nine. Okay, so I know that off the top of my head, the number is not certain, but somewhere over four thousand languages exist on Earth right now. Um, um, and about 7,000 secretly. I s okay, a range four to 7,000. I thought we were doing the layperson <laughs> okay. thing. 7,000 right. is more than 4,000. <laughs> okay, I just I'm thought you might want to start really? with some say at numbers. least 4,000, though, and there are at <laughs> least nine, too. Mm. Mathematically, you're quite correct. Okay, mm. so four to 7,000 now times mm. by uh, <laughs> let's say 10,000 years. Um, okay, uh, let's go with. Uh, 100,000 languages in the history of 100,000 languages. Okay. okay. Decent okay. guess. Okay. Does anyone else want to pitch in? Well, I cheated and I looked at this ahead of time. So 
<laughs> yes, it, it looks like I got. I saw the tweet as well, but I didn't. I didn't peek. It's uh, it's from Sverko Johansson, who's done some provocative. I, w I don't want to say back of the envelope calculations because I think this is much more sophisticated. I think this would require many envelopes. But it's a talk from the Proto Lang mm -hmm. conference, and he's tweeted it as well. So we'll put a link on becauselanguage.com. None of that is a guess, Stola. Start make with the guessing. Yeah. Yeah, right. exactly. None of those are guesses. So uh, Daniel hasn't looked. <laughs> what is your guess? Okay, so we've got, first of all, languages come and languages go. And I know the usual problem with defining what yeah, a yeah, language yeah, yeah, yeah. is. All right. Number, but number. So much more stalling. So much more stalling. I'm, I'm going to say that a language completely replaces itself on the average of maybe 1,000 years. That's that's So there are 7,000 languages okay. now. There might have been seven thousand languages before, but then there were there. So anyway, just keep multiplying by a thousand, depending on how many thousand year chunks there were since humans started speaking. Yeah, now, you're in the right direction. If this is the similar direction that he goes in, yeah, mm -hmm. is it? I'm thrilled. Okay, but then I got to say, the first group of humans, we're talking, a hundred and fifty thousand years ago, um, probably mm -hmm. didn't speak seven thousand languages. They probably spoke one. And then it branched out. So there's a cone, right? So let's just say that there's a hundred chunks of a thousand years. There's seven thousand languages now. Let's say seven million. No wait, did seven I say million? Okay. Sorry, sorry. No, no I, I dropped million to zero. Is I dropped to zero. Uh, Adam, do you have a guess? Uh, so I'm guessing what this other dude says. That's basically. <laughs> Um, or... Well, you're giving your guess, and then we'll <laughs> okay. say what this guy says, and then <laughs> okay. you know yeah, yeah, who's sure. right, who's to say. Um. I think the problem with basing it on the current number of languages is because there's been massive amounts of um, linguicide in the last 400 years because of 400, 500 years because of um, European um, white people because yeah. of colonialism. Yeah, white people. It, it because of colonialism. So um, it's not totally clear to me. Maybe it's not totally clear to me whether that type of process of massive linguistic extinction is something that's repeated itself over and over again or not throughout history. Maybe. Um, so I don't, that's sort of the tricky part for me. Um, so mm -hmm. I would, but uh, assuming it's not, I'd put the number probably even higher. Um, so if you start off with, if you, if you, so try to subtract away from colonialism and the Atlantic slave trade. How many would there be? I think there'd probably be at least triple, right? And then you go back from there. I'll do the same <laughs> logic and I'll say 210 million. Whoa. 210 wow. million. Wow. So, uh, Taylor, did you also guess? I th uh, yes. So I did read the, 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 oh, yes, you read on it. the tweet. You're but... discarded. <laughs> it's discarded. Do you mean disqualified? Don't discard me, but I was um, <laughs> oh, I looked at the I looked at the the pictures, but I was shocked at the number he came up with because I think in mm -hmm. my head I was being much more conservative than the math would would show up. Yeah. So I like how everybody's like, oh, and then we're gonna do all this math and take this out. And I I was just thinking, like, I don't know, a couple hundred thousand. <laughs> like I wasn't doing the math. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And secretly, the answer all along was nine. <laughs> uh, no, so so in this, uh, I should say this is uh, some slides I've been shared on Twitter by Jonas Nelle from uh, Sverker Johansson's uh, talk at Protolang, and he comes up with 3.4 million different languages, different languages. But hold on, he says that only 25% of the ones are spoken by Homo sapiens. So he clearly has a bit of a different mm. definition of language than I think most of you. So 25% of 3.4 million, I went and asked my math husband, and he said it's 850,000. Oh, so um, that's languages. closer to my number in my head. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because I, I said, I mistakenly said 7 million because I added a zero, but I actually meant to say 7,000 times 100, which is 700,000. So, 700, so I was pretty close. There you go. There you go. convenient retroactive That's modulation. That's how we prefer uh, to do it. To yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I'll, 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 retro I'll retroactively, you know, go back a few zeros as well with my answer. <laughs> yeah. We'll just paint those targets around where we shoot. How's that? <laughs> yeah.
So for this calculation, he did uh, similar things to you guys, like estimating that maybe uh, the lifespan of a language is about 1,000, 2,000 years. But he looked at um, modern day um, populations that we know about in Australia and in Americas that are classified as hunter gatherers, assuming that that is what is more common further back in time for our species. Um, and then uh, looks at what population numbers they have per community group, and then looks at population stats backwards in time and various bottlenecks and things like that. And then he comes up with this number. Uh, mm. We'll put the link to the tweet in our show notes. I can really recommend uh, flipping through the little slides. It was uh, good fun. So 3.4 million different languages ever. And about half of those are what he classifies as proto languages. Um, mm. So maybe we would say then Oh, now I have to do 3.4 divided by 2. Uh, my math 7. brain. 1.7, thank you. Yeah, of course. Sorry. <laughs> I redeemed myself from my order of magnitude error. <laughs> um, that are what we might call languages, and then 850,000 of those spoken by uh, Homo sapiens. So, yeah, pretty neat, I thought. It's good to think about. It certainly puts in perspective how many languages are alive now. Besides what uh, Adam already brought up with that there are probably many more languages about four or 500 years ago before white people colonization of the planet. If we go further back in time, uh, there must have been even more. And it, it tells us something about what are the specimens of, of our language capability that are alive today and sort of what might we have lost backwards in time. We can only really say something about the languages we know about now and maybe they're outliers we don't know let's hope not um <laughs> but yeah i thought that's pretty neat that's a cool question i like just digging into weird little questions like that so that's cool thanks yeah let's see this next one was suggested by diego on patreon yes about the history of language and how we can tell what it was like this one comes from a huge team of people including lead author hiromi matsumai damian blasi hello and Balthazar Bikal yes, at the University of Zurich. It was published in Science Advances. Yes. Let me just pitch for this one. And then Hedwig, I'm going to hand it off to you in a bit because you, you're more okay. well-versed on this. But let's just say that you wanted to figure out how people in a certain area were related to each other. And you can obviously use genetics, and we do. But which linguistic factor would you want to use? Would you want to look at the words that they had in common? Would you like to look at the, the sounds they had in common? Would you like to look at the grammatical features they had in common? Or would you like to look at music, like the song structure that they have or the performance style that they Ooh. have, which would be the most indicative of shared heritage, shared uh, ancestry, shared history, shared history. Yeah. And well, uh, I can always yes. just speak from my experience. Uh, anyone that I have shared history with usually just hates me. So maybe you just look for who hates who and then you'd be like, well, they're clearly related to each other. <laughs> That's a legitimate method, I suppose. <laughs> mm. At least for shallow time. I would have thought art um, and performance would rate fairly highly. Obviously, we're, we're talking in sort of somewhat abstract terms right like we're not saying yes. oh like the art in one place and the other place have to be exactly the same and that's the only way you like if you can make linkages between art i would say that that would like for instance if one tradition is like 2d figures on earthenware and then in the other tradition you see like 2d tapestries but like the the kind and the style of the 2d re representations mm -hmm. of people is like vaguely similar i would say oh yeah that's pretty good it's probably a pretty good chance those people are related in some way but maybe the problem there is that maybe people borrowed from each other and influenced each other in a much more shallow time depth. So maybe um, they've been in contact with each other in, say, the last 100, 200 years, and they've copied each other's uh, artistic styles. So then we need to look for the thing that is least copyable, right? Well, we know uh, that we can copy yeah. words a lot. Like the thing that would only possibly push through yeah like so you would words is a terrible one right because we learn words like all the freaking time um just ask people who speak ave and have to hang around white people um <laughs> i'm thinking of probably grammar then i'm like grammar doesn't seem like a thing that you just like interact with someone who has a vastly different grammar from you and then go mm, i like the way you put all your words together i'm going to do that instead we go oh i like your word for hamburger i'll have that please yeah mm. i mean we talk about the intensity of contact and and it takes a very 
long, intense amount of language contact to transfer grammar. Like we do, we do loan words really easily. We can borrow sounds even when we need to do that. Like English took the zh sound from French. So you can have your sounds, your words, those are fairly easily borrowed, but it takes a lot to, to make grammar change or to get like full idioms to, to transfer over. So yeah, I would think that grammar would be rather stable too. Like I've, right. I've been on a linguistics podcast for six years now and I have known many, many, many people who speak French and German and like Italian. And I still, whenever someone explains to me that they say eyes blue instead of blue eyes, I'm like, well, that's just dumb and wrong. Obviously that can't be a thing <laughs> like that because it just sounds so completely unbelievably unnatural, right? Like it's just, right, it doesn't right. make any sense to a person when grammar switches, your brain's just like, <laughs> I don't understand. That's a yeah. very special feeling that I try to get my students to feel too. <laughs> <laughs> I want to break your brain now. Grammar is a feeling. We've talked about this before, right? I mean, mm. we're going to get more into grammar later, but but in many ways, I would argue that grammar is a feeling because when you hear something ungrammatical, you feel it. Mm -hmm. mm. Mm -hmm. So the answer is in this paper, they compared, um, they had 14 languages spoken in uh, Northeastern Eurasia, so we're talking uh, mainly Russia and uh, parts of, of Japan and Siberia. And West Greenlandic was also in the study, so they had 14 languages. They had 10 different language families or um, isolates, so language languages that don't have any known relatives. And they used a bunch of grammatical traits, phonological traits. They analyzed 283 songs into 41 musical features, and they used 40 lexical concepts. And they compared that with the history that they can derive from comparing the genome of these populations. And they found that there was very strong support for the idea that grammar is reflecting the population history of these communities better than lexicon. Where did art sit? Uh, not very good. I think it was worse than... I'm just going to click my way to the paper. I actually tried to read this paper uh, last night like a crazy person um, and went and found the actual paper and I have I have my notes of just like I don't get this at all, but cool. Like um <laughs> like you I was describe trying, general club. Because <laughs> I was trying to um to figure out how they were calculating distance and relation on all these things. And I was like, I understand music theory to a certain extent. I almost went to school for music. So how are they calculating distance from each other with these musical features, but I couldn't find it easily. Uh, yeah, they do a bunch of uh, interesting things um, that are a little bit complicated maybe to go through, but um, basically they derive distances from all of these different features, so they quantify the music and the grammar and things into different features. So for grammar, it's things like, do you put your adjective before or after the noun, actually, Ben, was one of them. Does your adjective agree in gender with your noun? Um, 25 of those type of things. And then 40 concepts that are supposed to be basic vocabulary, so supposed to be slow changing. And um, the idea is that while the basic vocabulary was able to trace the sort of medium time distance, so the ones that are known in the language families uh, fairly well, it was not able to connect the language families with each other. So if you imagine that you're constructing a language family, you get to a point where it's just like, I'm, I have no more information. This is the top level node in this tree. Um, and they argue that at that point, grammar is able to connect things and that the correlation, the association with the genome um, supports that. Um, so it's a, it's a pretty cool paper. Uh, it is in contrast to a paper that came out a while ago called the uh, uh, Dynamics of Language Systems by uh, Greenhill et al., where they argue that uh, grammatical features change faster than basic vocabulary features. So we currently have uh, this is a hot this is a hot topic, and I expect we'll see more papers of this style coming out. I should also say that when people talk about grammatical features, they're using different databases and different ways of quantifying the grammatical features. Um, so that could be a source of the different results as well. Mm. For sure. So some people are doing maybe when people think of grammar, they might think of words like the words in a pronoun system, like I, me, you, uh, whereas most typologists like I, I am one, think about things like, do you have this thing, yes or no? Uh, and those are quite different type uh, data. But anyway, it's a it's a fruitful, fertile, uh, fertile, 
Yes, fertile. Area yes, of research. Fruitful and, and fertile were both appropriate. Fruitful and fertile. <laughs> yeah. Are those doublets? Never mind. Anyway, <laughs> thanks, Hedvig. Spawn con alert. Give us one minute, 30 seconds. Boop. If you love language, and we know you do, there's a podcast that you should be checking out. It's Spectacular Vernacular on Slate. Yeah, it's pretty good. It's uh, two people that we have had on the show so many times that they are kind of honorary uh, <laughs> presenters, but clearly they decided to just like quit the band <laughs> yeah. and start their own band, which is actually really good. Rude. And I'm super jealous. Yeah, it's so rude. <laughs> no, it's but rude. also I hate, I hate when people go off and make good art without me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And that's exactly what they've done. Nicole Holiday and Ben Zimmer are smashing it over at Spectacular Vernacular, so you should check it out. What I love about the show is that not only do they have great interviews and they do a bit of news, but they also, at the end, have a bit where they'll spring a language game on a listener and on you. Oh, I want me and Hedvig to go on the show and so we can... <laughs> <laughs> do the thing that I love the most, which is get unbelievably competitive for no real reason. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So check out Spectacular Vernacular. I've added it to my list of regular linguistic podcast listens. They do new episodes bi-monthly. Bye. <laughs> no, don't. They release new episodes every other Tuesday. So that is two episodes every month. Fortnightly, Daniel, you terrorist, you Fine. linguistic Fine monster. Monthly. Wherever you get your podcasts, whatever your dealer is. Bi monthly. <laughs> it's not bi monthly. It's just, uh, just stop it. Fortnightly. <laughs> Fortnightly. All right, fine. <laughs> we are here with Taylor Miller and Adam Tallman talking about the linguistic school of thought called generativism. And thank you both for being here. Thanks for having us. Very happy to be here. You've told us a bit about your work, so thanks for that. We've already had a discussion with John Goldsmith and David Adger about how generativism got to be this way. And one of the takeaways that I got from that was we asked, you know, what what is generativism? How would you describe it? What is the goal? And John's answer was to make a grammar or a, a machine or a computer program or some contrivance to distinguish the grammatical sentences from the ungrammatical sentences. And that if you did that, then you were a generativist. And David's answer was to see what a possible language looks like and doesn't look like, because some things are very common, some things are not very common at all, and some things just never happen. Why? Do you feel like either of those definitions kind of seems current or do either of those seem maybe not so relevant anymore? Adam, do you want to go first? Yeah, I think the definitions or the ideas given by um, Goldsmith and Adger sound about right to me. That's how I understood it as well. The one thing I would add that I actually think Adger pointed out was that one of the important parts of the history of generative linguists is that this model is general. So it's accounting for kind of all languages simultaneously in a way, because you could imagine just doing a generative grammar of a single language and not being able to necessarily um, use that model on the next language. I think one of the things that Goldsmith said that I found the most salient was this idea of distinguishing between ungrammatical and grammatical sentences and how that wasn't necessarily a big goal before. But I would say that even amongst um, linguists who don't consider themselves generativists, that's something that they all are trying to do as well. So if your goal is to just figure out a, way, a model of linguistic behavior in a way that, that accounts for speakers' intuitions about uh, distinguishing between ungrammatical and grammatical sentences, it's fine in a way to say that, but it's so broad that I think it pretty much encompasses everyone at this point. Yep. So, um, True. Yeah. So Adger's idea about a pos distinguishing between possible languages and impossible ones, uh, I think sort of has this problem too. Um, but the, the problem comes in, I think, when you, there might be a different perspective where you start saying, well, really what we should be doing, because we don't know about you know, these um, 3.4 million languages, the best we can do is probable versus improbable languages. And their theory maybe should be more concerned with that. But the difference between possible and impossible and probable and improbable, uh, there's a sort of limiting point where there's, it's very hard to distinguish between them. So there's, there's points at which I would say the definitions they gave are accurate, but they're not specific enough to allow us to understand how 
the distinction between generativist and non-generativist um, explanations are actually used in the field and how the you know conflicts sort of emerge. So yes and no, um, I would say. <laughs> right. I, I agree with Adam. I thought it was maybe a bit under specific. Yeah. I mean, I had been thinking about this too um, because I was trying to think if that was sufficient and I, I, I don't necessarily, I, I agree with Adam that I think when you break it down like that, no linguist is going to say, no, that's not what we do. Like, I mean, that's what you want to do. You want to find a model of language that accounts for what is possible and impossible, what works and what doesn't. You want to push the boundaries and see if you can break it, right? Like see what what works and what doesn't in whatever form of language that you're working at. I think that generativism really started with Chomsky's idea of nativism and that there was this innate language faculty and that that was a specifically evolved capacity in humans. And then he had this idea of treating language like a computer, you know, inspired by the Turing machine, and that you could generate infinite possibilities from a finite set of tools, right? So you have a finite set of phonemes, a finite set of word formation rules, a finite set of phrase structure rules, what have you. And then from those things, you get infinity where you have linguistic creativity and all these different languages. That's what started with principles and parameters theory when it first like formalized and, and started as standard theory, extended standard theory, and what have you throughout the history of it. Um, and when it comes down to it, I think the, the biggest takeaway of generativism versus others, like functionalism, or you can look at anthropology or sociolinguistics or whatever you have, is that this idea that there's this innate language specific faculty versus not versus it's an evolutionary accident that we have language right like we had to develop uh finite uh fine motor skills in order to use tools and so why not expand that usage to be about speech right and and transfer it to the vocal tract or we already use hand eye coordination with a visual language that makes a lot of sense which is why a lot of evolutionary linguists have argued that you had started with sign language and then it transferred over to spoken language. Um, but so it has to do with the origin of language, which is the big question, right? Is mm -hmm. it this innate idea or, or is it like we happen to have these skills and they got repurposed for language, like at the core of it. And Chomsky then had his like, um, his little apostles, right? He had his, his, his group of students and they were all like, this is revolutionary. We need to take this idea and run with it. And then they all ran with it. And that's where you have the split, right? Mm -hmm. It's like the generativist or the innatist versus other. Um, right. Yeah. Do you think, um, cause we were talking earlier on the show as well about like, if it's possible to be describe yourself as a generativist without being a nativist. And some people were like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I think, Maybe. I think it is now. Um, and Adam may, may disagree with me. Um, but I think like, obviously in the seventies, when this was first taking off, um, this was a, a huge, a, a huge issue is that, um, you know, this idea of context-free analysis, looking at language in a vacuum and just looking at the patterns and the puzzles and to create this model that could generate grammar um, mm -hmm. versus looking at language in context, looking at the function of communication, the context of the conversation, the culture, all of that. Um, and that's where everybody was splitting, right? How best to study language um, to answer the big question of where it comes from. And I think at this point in the year 2021, most people in our generation, like Adam and me, where we all came up in grad school around the same time and are now doing um, research, like we just don't care <laughs> about that question. Um, yep. It's like a cool question, um, but it's philosophical to me. Like it, it seems almost like a religion where I cannot falsify that. I cannot tell you how it showed up. I cannot tell you if it's an evolutionary accident or innatist. And there's certainly studies that we can do to try to expose that issue more, but we're never going to know. Like 
No. We're just not going to know. And so in my opinion, why are we taking the time to ask that question then? Like <laughs> what we know, what we know is that regardless of the origins of language, babies come in ready to acquire language. Like there's something in them that says I need to get a sound system, a word system, a sentence system. And they do that. <laughs> so like whether it's an epiphenomenon of all of these different processes or it's this innate language faculty who cares they do it so let's study wow. it wow so taylor um we brought you on this show to be the more generative i know i know and that's what okay so i want to talk about this surprise <laughs> I am, no one expects the spanish generativism i know i so i i was like oh no because the way i always talk about it is that i'm a dirty generativist and i know it Right. Like I am. If you're I, a dirty generative. <laughs> like I, I cannot <laughs> run away from it. My training is 150% generative. It's like, and, and I know that's why you have me on the show because like <laughs> I went to Rutgers as an undergrad. I went to university of Delaware as a grad student. I actually took the time last night to tally up the number of professors that I've worked directly with who were Chomsky students or worked like indirectly with Chomsky as part of like um, like their advising committee or something like the super general. And there's this list of seven here <laughs> that I have worked with that are like, um, like either Chomsky's advisees or like I'm his grandbaby in terms of linguistics. Right. Like, so mm -hmm. I am the most generativist you can and get. Grateful grandbaby. It seems yes. a little well, bit. Yeah. It's changed over the years, right? Like, I remember being an undergrad and I thought functionalists were, like, mythical. Like, I didn't think that they existed. Oh. Um, so I mean, so I should say I come from the different, I come from a very <laughs> functional department. Right. Uh, and Adam, I would describe Winnipeg, University of Manitoba, as a fairly, well, split, like, not necessarily as generative as, as for example, Toronto or other places in the U.S., certainly. And I was brought up to believe that Chomsky was like not. I mean, the reading devil? between the lines, like yeah, Antichrist. Like <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I've had and, that experience, and I remember thinking, yeah, it. This well, can't. I. They can't be this evil. They can't possibly <laughs> like, believe that. Like it was like mm. I remember getting into grad school and I met someone that they said I don't believe in universal grammar and I was like I found you. Like it was like you exist. <laughs> I heard lore that this was a real thing, but I didn't know for sure. Um, and it, it's, you know, it, it changed. Like, I know that I drip in generativism and it will, it affects how I look at everything, right? My, my go-to lens is that like, yeah, you take Turing, you take the Turing machine, you get Chomsky, then you get generative grammar and then you study that and the end. And, mm. um, but you know, over the years I have, sh I have certainly, pulled back on it um, because I have gotten very anti armchair linguistics. Um, yes. And another that... reason we brought you two on the show is because you're both field workers. And I think you represent a sort of a new angle on like the next generation of linguists right. through specifically that lens. So Adam can certainly add his, his two cents in, but like that's, I have changed dramatically since I first started studying linguistics, um, much to the chagrin of a lot of people that I studied linguistics with, because I'm just like, it doesn't matter. Like, just do the work. Like, what's wrong with you? Just be a good scientist and don't be racist. Like, that's my kind of my <laughs> life philosophy. <laughs> yeah, Adam, what, what do you think? How much does this affect you? Well, this is sort of getting into the second question, how oh, are you introduced sure. to the labels? <laughs> um, so I'll try to answer the, how I, how these, how I was introduced to this distinction between generativism and functionalism. Probably, um, correct me if I'm wrong, Hedvig, you, you think, you said University of Manitoba is mostly generativist or that's how you, was your impression? Well, like more I, I mean, when I was it's there, mixed. there was Yila Gomeshi who was generativist and then Terry and most of, uh, many of the others. It felt like a, a, a mix. Yeah. Uh, actually, one of the reasons I went to Winnipeg was because I looked at the linguistics departments for like all of like lots of places in Canada and US and Winnipeg seemed the least, least generative of the mm. places I could go to. Sure. 
Yeah, it was a mix. So my be- my experience wasn't like Taylor's, but there were things that I was shocked of when I left Manitoba. I think the thing I was shocked of, I was shocked about people who took a lot of specific hypotheses from generativist grammar for granted, rather than right. seeing them as interesting things that we could study. They just thought they were true. Like I remember this being completely blown away, like meeting a student from MIT And I was like, oh, I found some evidence for the VP shell hypothesis. And he was like, why would you need evidence? We already know this. And at UT Austin, it was like, it was up, we were debating that. So my experience there was a little bit different. But going back a bit, um, I became aware of the distinction in syntax classes and in language acquisition classes, um, but taught by Lorna McDonald, who was a functionalist. But the idea was that the classes would primarily teach you these things from the generative perspective. So it was sort of, I was, and in the class, she taught both perspectives, which I was really confused by. Like, it was like, how can this, how, we're sort of sitting there here talking about how we're a science, but then there seems to be this huge dividing line. Uh, and uh, at the University of Manitoba, you know, you had Yila Gome- you have Yila Gomeshi, now you have um, Will Oxford, who does, who's more of a generativist, I think, overall. For sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the, the, the people at y- Winnipeg are, it's one of these weird departments where it's mixed and you could go talk to professors about their opinions and nobody agreed with each other. And I realized that later that that wasn't normal. I think the normal state (laughs) of affairs is that you have, you're like UCSB and like Chomsky is the devil and, uh, or somewhere else. And, and the generativists are just completely insane. For sure. There's, there's been a couple times where I've thought about applying for a job and I thought that my CV would just like burst into flames when it entered the department. Like it would yeah. just be like, oh no, the Chomsky's full, like bleeding off of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. So there's there's that. And then there's, of course, departments, um, University of Toronto, I think a little bit, obviously MIT, where UCSB isn't as, as bad I've found, but it's it's still pretty it's still pretty in one camp where it's, it's actually, there's a, it's much more homogeneous in terms of the perspectives and angles that people take. Right. Um, and then I went to UT Austin and it's similar, except that they, there's a lot of people who believe a different brand of generative theories like LFG and uh, HPSG that were talked about. Like so, functional grammar like and- so, uh, head, head, uh, um, Head-driven, head-driven phrase, structure, phrase structure, grammar. structure grammar. Yeah. Thank you. And so, so like, these um so for me it was always at the forefront that there was this sort of conflict and and over time i think um just because it was sort of it became more like look there's a good functional explanation or there's a good formal explanation it's not really about which or good generativist explanation or good innate architecture explanation because you can embed functionalist explanations within generative grammar but i'll i'll put that aside for a second that you can that it, it became really like, because so many hypotheses in our field seem to be untestable and unfalsifiable, which is what right. Taylor was talking about. I'm just like, mm-hmm. no, no, no. Give me a testable theory. I don't right. care. I don't care if it's functionalist or generativist. I just want you to say something contentful that isn't just, that isn't just all languages are like this abstract thing that you can't consistently identify and furthermore need not have any empirical signal, which is like a very common thing that I think occurs across the discipline. Right. Um, yeah. I think this unfalsifiability thing really needs to, we need to zoom in on it because it's a major problem for me. Can you tell me why you think that generativism might in some way be unfalsifiable? Well, I don't, I, okay. Yeah, I'll just, go ahead, Adam. So I don't think generativism is unfalsifiable and I don't think that's the issue because it's a program, okay. right? It's okay. that there's a lot of hypotheses within generativism and a lot of hypotheses within functionalism that aren't falsifiable. And to me, that's kind of one of the rubrics of what making what makes something scientific to begin with. So Taylor, go yeah, ahead. Yeah, you've got to be able to prove it is wrong. Yeah. Yeah. For instance, um, like there's always, there's always the step where you have a hypothesis, right? Like let's go ahead and take universal grammar and just lean into the controversy, right? So we have the universal, so universal grammar, grammar hypothesis, is, sorry, a hypothesis, uh, right? Okay. So like the hypothesis is that everyone has this pre-programmed bio program that's language specific and it can come in with as much detail or as not depending on what you find, right? That was the whole <laughs> purpose of principles and parameters. Wow, that's vague. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
Okay. It was the whole purpose of principles and parameters then to define what were these principles that governed UG. Like what was something that was in the grammar that we could show that's like universal across all languages. So then we can show that that's what we come in with. Um, and what principles and parameters learned over the next 20, 30 years was that <laughs> you can't do it. Like you can't do it. There, you get so bogged down in these details. It turned into micro parameters. It turned into like all of these things like I've circles done on circles, right? Like I've done some research on like the polysynthesis parameter, right? So I became really interested if there was a theoretically valuable way to define polysynthetic languages in a way that it's not just descriptive. So these languages are, Say what polysynthesis is. Just, so yeah. <laughs> poly, I'm getting there. So polysynthetic <laughs> languages are languages which take the entire meaning of like an English sentence, like, and then they they plop it all into a single word, okay? And mm. I just I just felt some people cringe because that's how I defined it. But I'm simplifying in a way. But this has been a debate for, I think the term started in 1831. I think it was Sergeant mm -hmm. Whip, like that. Whipple. Is, is that did I make that up? Anyway, um, but it it went back to like 1830s where this idea of these are these exotic languages that have these really long words that translate to a whole sentence. And so they're really weird. And that's to contrast with languages like Mandarin that are very isolating and have like one one morpheme or meaning per word. Right. So it's just like word, 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 as opposed to. In Kiowa, my favorite word translates to she forcibly sent him to out, go out rabbit hunting. It's all one verb complex. It's all right there. And so I remember learning about this in undergrad and being like, that's the best thing that's ever happened. I want to learn everything I can about these sentence words. Um, and there's a huge debate about this, about whether or not you can define this, whether or not you can, like, successfully define all polysynthetic languages to the exclusion of other languages. And you can't. I, I went through and, and just looked at one principle or parameter, the polysynthesis parameter, and showed that both the weakest interpretation of it, that there would be any of these topics shown in like a, a cluster maybe to, to def define polysynthetic languages versus all of the requirements, um, the strongest uh, version where all the requirements would have to be present. Um, none of it works. You can always find something that there's a language that somebody considers to be polysynthetic, but it doesn't fit the definition that you have. And so mm. there's a lot of people, Not a good category, right? There's a lot of people who try to make that, but they don't do so in a testable way. They just say, well, morphology does a lot. And you're like, okay, but what does that mean? And like, how can I test that? And at a certain point, you have to say, am I describing the situation? Or am I explaining the situation, right? To go back to Chomsky's levels of adequacy. Again, the dirty generativist coming out, right? So um, <laughs> that's just what I'm, that's, that's what I'm talking about is like, if I, if I can't falsify it or test it, then it's mm. philosophy. And that's cool. Let's talk about it. Maybe there's a reason why we have an intuition that these languages are special. Let's dig into that. But I don't think that there's a way that we can principledly and predictively talk about certain things. So what it sounds like you're saying is that um, a lot of the questions that used to really define the field of theoretical linguistics maybe 20, 30 years ago are sort of to you as a uh, younger scholars not really affecting your day-to-day -day research that much well we, well we have to interact with the older generation and, and they and they believe those things so. <laughs> every once so in a while that. adam and i and even other people that are our age like i work closely with hannah sandy at uc berkeley um with natalie weber at yale uh you know adam and i work together uh like it's it's all these people that were like yeah like that's a question but what I'm really interested in is in like the structure of grammar, like what what kinds of things are obviously interacting with one another? What things like do we need a morphology or do we just go syntax only? Like 
I can ask that question and go really in depth with it and not care where it comes from. I'm just interested right. in the architecture of language as we see it now and, and what we can learn from that. And if the answer to why we do certain things is, well, it's a biological program that you can go back to biology and see this functional explanation for X, Y, and Z. Awesome. Um, or if it's evidence that maybe there is something that's innate to linguistics or language. Awesome. But it's not Sounds like my focus. Catholicism. Yeah. It sounds like, like the younger generation are all people who grew up Catholic. And if asked, so like, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I mean, I guess I'm Catholic. But then, if, but then someone's like, what's your opinion on the catechisms? You'd all be like, I don't fucking know. <laughs> like, who um, cares? Yeah. yeah. Um, I think I, I was wondering if I could take a step back and actually say what um, falsifiability is and where it comes from. So we're sure. not. I think I think that's maybe what Daniel was getting at. So um, falsifiability is this idea that comes from Karl Popper. And basically the idea is that um, scientific conjectures can never really be proven right. People debate a about conjecture. that. A conjecture is a guess about some what or a hypothesis about <laughs> what something is true. So you can have a you can have a conjecture that there that all swans are white. And no matter how many white swans you find, that'll never prove that all swans are white. But yeah. if you can falsify it, if you can find one black swan, that demolishes the entire Edifice. I always use the swan example. Sure. Mm -hmm. I think I think more the more important point for what me and Taylor are talking about is how it delimits a scientific versus a non-scientific hypothesis. And one yep. of the problems is, is that hypotheses can be formulated in a way that sounds like they're testable. But then when you look into detail about how the linguist or any of us would go about testing it, you realize that it's actually circular or that it's self-referential or that it's referring to a whole bunch of theoretical concepts that aren't clearly defined. Um, so mm. basically the falsifiability is that you don't have a theory unless you could in principle think of a way to show that it's wrong. If you just, this, it's, a re it's basically the reason that if I tell you that I think stuff is gonna happen in the future, you're not gonna think I'm a prophet, right? I have to be able to make, I have to be able to say something that's contentful enough so that we could design an experiment to test it. And there's right. been a whole bunch of, you know, there's, there's a lot of caveats to this statement. I mean, the things about white swans and black swans, I mean, you, if you think about it from a Bayesian perspective, you might, you might think, yes, you can have inductive evidence for things. There's a lot written about this, for instance, by somebody like Ian Hacking or somebody like that. But the basic idea uh, underlying everything is that if you cannot formulate a way that in principle would make you change your views, you do not have a scientific theory. And then the added condition is also that we have to have methods that allow us to gather data in such a way that it would not just prejudge our theory to be correct. Right. So, so following along something David Adger said in his criticism of everything that he didn't consider to be generativist, I guess, he said, well, my response to all of them is, why do we never see X, Y, Z? Um, and there's lots of things like this that are stated. Some of them I think are on the table, but a lot of the statements that have been made about what's universal where they say, well, you never find this, it's because the this is defined in such a vague way, it's basically a moving target. So you have a, mm. so he actually mentioned a case with, with Bantu languages. I don't know anything specific about this case, but he referenced a whole bunch of theory internal notions like coordination, which doesn't have a clear definition. If I found something that looked like it might falsify what he was saying, I found a coordinate structure that maybe contradicted his hypothesis. You could shrug your shoulder and say, I don't think that's a coordinate construction. I think it's this other thing. And now it doesn't falsify the theory. And if the methodology is constructed in a way that there's always that type of escape hatch, it's not truly testable. So when, mm. so when Adger says, well, why don't you ever find this? It's like, well, we don't find this because I know you've analyzed this out of existence. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that it's actually testable. You have to be able to clearly state, making reference to things that you could observe based on, based on um, the properties of languages that we can observe, what types of properties would make you test your hypothesis and then develop methods that are that um, actually test them severely methods that make it improbable uh, that uh, this this test this theory would pass this test if it were false for instance but we don't develop those methods we just conjecture and that's good enough and then rationalize away uh, counter evidence right well and that's true so in both camps for me it's so, yeah. true it's true across the board like anybody's gonna get a fence not, they're going to get defensive if they believe something. 
and you show them counter evidence to it. This is true outside of linguistics, right? We don't like being contradicted. But the point of science is to put forward your idea and then welcome the discussion that says, like, actually, I do have counter evidence for that and to take it and to to include that in what you do moving forward. Um, like I have made my entire research career at this point all about taking things that people take for granted and then breaking them. So like this is a <laughs> definition or a word that you use constantly. I don't think it means what you think it means. Let's look at it. Um, or like this is a stress pattern in Ojibwe that you think is attested across the board and has been for 150 years of Algonquian literature. Just kidding. It doesn't. Look at these recordings and this analysis of this that it doesn't show up and we need to not just recycle ideas throughout the decades yeah. and actually go back and retest things. I, I just have one thing to add. The one thing I would say in response to this is a typical response to you showing counter evidence is to say, that's not real counter evidence. Mm. And then to reanalyze it in such a way that it, it ends up corroborating the theory. And, and that's right. really common. And then when you get that situation, that's even more frustrating than somebody who basically just do ignores the evidence in a way because they basically have a theory that sounds like it's testable. But when you look at it in relation to data, you're like, wait, actually this isn't saying anything because mm, right. anything could potentially be looked at from a different perspective and now it works. Um, those are, that's actually really common as well. Anyways, I just wanted to clarify that point, yeah, but continue. Yeah. So how much of these conflicts are uh, juggling terminology? A lot. Yeah. A lot of them are like my, my entire PhD thesis was um, looking at the phonology syntax interface. So how do sounds pattern in different kinds of structures, syllables, words, phrases, clauses, that kind of thing. And there mm -hmm. are a couple current theories that are very popular in the literature at the time, at this time. So like you've got um, an older theory called relational grammar, which comes from Nesper and Vogel, 1986, and is a very generative look at what's going on. And then you've got um, Lisa Selkirk's work on match theory and related other kinds of theories. Mm -hmm. um, you've got um, the cyclic spell out approaches to, to, to okay. um, syntax. The, you don't have to worry about all of these different kinds of things, but there are these theories that people will advocate for. And if you offer them counter evidence, they'll just say, no, 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 and put like a Band-Aid on it. They'll go, that's not actually counter evidence. I'm going to look at it slightly differently and just kind of go, it's fine. And so what I was able to do is say that none of the current theories asked the right question. None of the current theories asked the crucial question, which is if I'm looking for a theory about how sounds pattern at words and phrases and clauses and all that stuff, you got to go look at a language that blends all those things together and breaks all your definitions and then see if your theory can account for them. So a lot of people will do a theory and look at Japanese and English and maybe mm. Chinese, these majority languages, and then just explicitly uh, of ignore, whether intentional or not, um, ignore these languages that do blend the lines between words, phrases, and clauses, that do yeah. have extreme morphosyntactic complexity that would be the actual test for these kinds of ideas. And so in my thesis, I took two such languages, did a side-by-side -side analysis, and showed that none of the current theories work. Mm -hmm. And I said, so rather than ascribing to a theory because it's what I like or what I started, I looked at the data and went, this doesn't work. We have to start over. And we can take good from all of these ideas that have kernels of truth in them and then put something together that works. So, like, I'm always the, the pain in the butt at a conference. Like, there's, <laughs> there's an older linguist who always comes up and goes, ah, Dr. Miller, what prized idea are we breaking today? Like, and I'm just like, it's what we do. Like, Is that Professor... Um, <laughs> Let's, it, uh, yes, <laughs> he can, can cut it. It doesn't matter. Yeah, um, you can cut but, it. Uh, but yeah. So, so is the answer that we should just like burn all the old books and no, just, just no, scrim. you can. Edvig, what do we know about burning books? Easy <laughs> is the answer. We got to do the work, and we don't worry too much about the big questions, which is super depressing because I love the big questions. 
I love the big questions too, but at a certain point, if it's not something like we can sit there, this is what I think of. This is how I consider like the different questions is like, do you want to like sit around a table and ask those big questions and pontificate, which is a valid use of time, but don't market that as science, right? Like, that is philosophy that you lead to these cool hypotheticals of what language is and how it behaves and how it has changed over time or the origins of it. I've taken entire classes on those big questions and I love it. But at the same time, when I'm doing my research, that's not what I'm going to be writing about. I, I right. do not claim to have authority to tell you how language came about because I can't know, but I can tell you how phonology and syntax are interfacing. And if there's evidence that we actually need a separate morphology, like those are things that I can go in and, and look at. So I guess this leads us into one of our questions. We've talked about some ways in which generativism doesn't help your work, but how does it help your work? What does it help you to do that you wouldn't be able to do otherwise? Do you need it? Absolutely. I have I have this answer. I was like, it's hugely important. Linguistic theory and the way that I think about it helps everything that I do. So I largely publish in theory and I'm working on a new model of the phonology syntax interface. It's called Tri-P Mapping, if anybody's really interested. Um, but um, it's prosodic phonology by phase. So I talk about a different way of looking at syntax and, and, and phonology. Um, and but I also, um, and I, I'm like collaborating with Hannah Sandy at Berkeley for a few papers on looking for the definition of the word and how to apply um, this new interface approach Ooh, with definition her co word. by phase. Definition of the word. Yeah, yeah, I love, I love digging into that. And spoiler, like words are not things. But anyway, <gasps> like we go and we look at we look at these idiosyncratic phenomena that have largely stumped theories in the past and we're trying to account for them so there are ways that we can do that and i also um i try to keep in mind these scientifically sound questions in my language documentation work as well so like I want materials to be easily understood to a non-linguist. I want them to be able to be used in a community who's trying to reclaim their language, for instance. So I want to make sure that I can take these complex linguistic concepts that have frameworks involved or theories used as tools and be able to be like, but let me explain what language is doing just on a basic level so that you can understand it, right? Like, let mm. me explain what a phonological process is and how that affects how you speak the language. And so this is why you need to pronounce it this way. Or like, it's systematic. Did you want to know or do you want to memorize? Like, these are things that you can teach language learners. And so the way that I always explain my thought process is that I think that language can and should be studied context free, but that the speakers of language are not in a vacuum. So your job doesn't stop there. So mm. study language in a vacuum as its own system and puzzle, but then recognize that the people who are using this language are not, and that there are social pressures that affect things like historic mistreatment, racism, social justice issues, the pressures that people would have to give up their language, why the language is in trouble in the first place. You can't divorce them from that. I used to, as an undergrad, people would tell me, just give me the data, don't, I don't want to talk to the people. Like, this is a real thing that generativists have historically said, right? And that's why Chomskyans are often called the devil, <laughs> okay? <laughs> because it's like I'm taking I'm stripping away all of reality and I'm just looking at a computer like they could be speech sounds or numbers or symbols or what have you. I'm just finding patterns mm. and and there is a beauty to that. I really do think that there is because then you are asking hypotheses, you're testing them, you're seeing what's logically possible, what's not. And that can help you learn about language. But that's not the end. Like the next step is to realize that you have an obligation to both the language itself and the people who speak this language to make it accessible in both the way of understanding it, but also like having them physically be able to get their hands on the stuff. Yeah, this is something we've talked about before on the show, mm. that there's a new wave of linguists doing fieldwork today where they are much more, this goes for people who 
you know, subscribe to generative linguistic theory and who don't subscribe to any right. theory and who subscribe to another theory, that um, there's a sense that we should be giving back to communities. Um, but I was wondering about the first thing you said, which is studying language without context, because some would argue, and maybe that's where the word functional comes in, in the term right. functional linguistics, is that we shouldn't even do that, right? right. <laughs> we, we should, uh, like, it matters if you want to say something very often. Uh, it matters um, what kind of semantic connotations you have has an impact on uh, your, your languages, uh, the structure in themselves. Absolutely. And I think that's where I would say that I'm still a generativist in terms of that opinion. And I will get into arguments with people on Twitter. I do it all the time of just... <laughs> Like, it is possible to be a generativist and not be an armchair linguist who's pontificating and ignoring things like the historic classism and racism of generative grammar. Like, the fact that we started studying language in a vacuum gave a lot of white men the power to sit there and wonder about these tiny Amazonian languages or to discount entire languages because, well, if you just study English, you can get generative grammar and you don't need to work that hard. You don't have mm. to go into the field. You don't have to go work with communities. And so there's this idea that like, I'm not working in a people facing field. I can just sit here and think about language. And that is where I fundamentally have changed. Mm. So I have said it before, like, just give me the data, I'll do the data. And don't get me wrong, I love working on language puzzles, and I will do it all the time. But I could not go into the field and do work on languages and not feel like something needed to be done. Like, I felt an obligation that comes from being someone who knows, who has the skills that I have, who knows about how language is working and how to study it, and who knows how to take those linguistic concepts and boil them down into something that someone can understand, that it's an obligation and a duty to do that. And hmm. I don't necessarily think that everyone needs to drop everything and do that. Like there's, um, there's a phrase in the linguist documentary where uh, he says, like, I don't understand how someone could just study French forever, French syntax forever, taking a, a jab at a particular linguist um, and not go and do field work and, and do documentation work. And I don't necessarily agree with that. But I do think that it is on every linguist to make sure that the data that they have is accessible to the people who need it. Mm -hmm. And so whether that's making sure that a linguist translate it, translates it into layperson English, for lack of better term, mm -hmm. or like usable language knowledge. Um, I think a uh, previous guest on the show, Leslie Wood, used the term plain language. Plain, plain language. language. I grammar. think that's a really mm. good one. Mm. So I've actually been working on this idea with a woman named Maura Sullivan, who's at Tulane University. And we had started the process and then the pandemic hit. So it's kind of like, uh, it's delayed, but we've been working on this idea of starting a nonprofit called the Coalition on Restorative Linguistics, which is the idea that um, linguists would be put into contact with community members who are interested in working with their language, either starting language classes or reclaiming it or whatever. And there is a grammar on the language or there is published work on the language, but mm -hmm. they can't but understand it. Yeah. And so so yeah. I remember being at a conference in 2019 that was on the Year of Indigenous Languages. This was in Indiana. And it was, you know, like two generativists and then a whole bunch of like community linguists and indigenous awesome people who have been going back to school to learn how to to do their language. And I'm like, it's link like indigenous people or people whose language has been historically mistreated should not be yeah. in a position where they have to take 10 years of schooling in order to read a book about their language. If they yeah. want to do that, awesome. I want to make that more easy for them. And there are, uh, there are um, organizations that do that, that give scholarships or have opportunities for indigenous people to work on their languages. But that does not change the fact that it would take me a half hour in the afternoon to read a part <laughs> of a grammar and explain it to someone. And so it's a service that, in this rush to document languages because of the fact that languages are 
are threatened and are, are sleeping after so many years, there's this rush and this emergency to document, 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 which was great. But that documentation was done at the expense of the communities. Like it did mm -hmm. the exact opposite of what we wanted it to do. And the fact that now you have all of this material that as a linguist I have access to, but the community members themselves have never seen it. They don't have copies or it's in an archive that you have to be a researcher in order to access. And so these are the kinds of things where we want to start this organization that pairs linguistics, like linguist volunteers who will work with community members and just help translate materials and, and help them get those ideas. Okay. I want to throw it to Adam. Adam, what does generativism help you to do? Can you give me something concrete that it helps you to do in your work? Huh. Um. <laughs> <laughs> or, or is there a, I mean, the question here was what importance does linguistic theory have in your day-to-day -day research? But I can ask the, I can answer the question about generativism specifically. Um, I love it. Or if they're different. <laughs> so the, it's not, I wouldn't say it's specifically generativism. I, I think that basically when you, and start analyzing a language and when you document a language it's a big task i think that when you're learning a lot of languages that have curriculums that have been developed for years you sort of take this for granted that oh and this chapter is going to teach you how to you know decline adjectives in german when they have an indefinite article and then this chapter is going to do this and it's got this structure to it that helps organize the grammar it you take for you might take for granted um, that it was like easy to organize a grammar, or easy, easy to even figure out what all those properties and rules are, or what the language even has and can do, and whether it has this. And but, and the problem with language description and documentation is, you know, the the task is sort of insurmountably hard. Um, so you start off, you start off basic, you need some sort of guideline. And sometimes uh, I, in my own experience doing field work where my primary concern like Taylor is to sort of, um, is uh, being faithful to the, to the language really in the community. Um, I've sort of just borrowed from everything. And so I'll take a generative theory and see, can I can I, does this theory make sense in the language? Can I test it? Can I use it to even learn something about the language? And often, often with generative theory specifically, um, the experience is roughly, oh, I could try to look at this in, in the languages we're working at. And so I'll, we'll ask a bunch of questions and you'll learn about, I'll learn, get more data and a bunch of different things in, that I didn't know about the grammar before that will help me learn about how it works. But then when I ask the question, good scientific theory that it's making you ask questions that you wouldn't have sure. thought of elsewhere. That's what we want them to do. Sure, exactly. But then the other step is, did I, is the theory corroborated or not in the language? And invariably, <laughs> the answer is always, I don't know, because the theory <laughs> actually isn't clear enough. So um, right. it's, it, it's, a, it's a relationship where theories have an, an important exploratory role. Like it's like, okay. I'll take, I could take an idea from Taylor's dissertation and see if it works and Chacobo. And then it might make me ask questions about the grammar that I hadn't asked before. And then I, and then I'll look, get a bunch of new data, but I might also just be like, actually, there's a problem here because there's this term that's not, it's not actually clear how this should apply in the grammar. It can be applied in four or five ways. And so um, that's the relationship uh, between what I would generative theory in my, in my research but I also find the question like a little bit strange because I don't know how you can do research without theories. Um, mm, yeah, so true theory neutral research is not a thing. That's not a thing. So yeah, um, uh, but there's another, the, the interesting thing about linguistics, I'll just put this in as a side, sort of following up on what Taylor said about a lot of armchair linguists is that the word linguistic theory, at least amongst a lot of people I'm around, has developed a sort of pejorative sense. I mean, you have to say it with a certain intonation. You're just like, oh, that's the theory. And it usually <laughs> means contentless nonsense, um, sort of the way um, Chomsky derides postmodernism. But I think it's partly because so much of the prestige and, um, and of what's called linguistic theory has been developed by people sitting on armchairs and we've and and then and then the rest of the languages of the world and field workers and people who are really dealing with data and trying to test the hypotheses are sort of an afterthought 
And the attitude is like, if they right. find something that works with my theory, great. If they don't, you know, I don't, I don't even want to talk to this person. They don't understand. Um, and that's kind <laughs> of, that's sort of the relation. So there's, there's a, there's a, there's a intellectual answer to that question, which is everything because there's no theory neutral research. And then a sociological uh, answer to the question, which is like, yes. which is like, well, there's these people in our field that have ordained themselves, the theoreticians, and I'm always in a, in a tense relationship with them because they'll, they'll be very happy if I find something that works with their theory, but very unhappy if I don't. I think, yeah. I yeah. think on that, one of the best things that I've ever been taught was from Jeff Hines, who's at Stony Brook now, and he was teaching us in grad school that theories and frameworks are tools. Mm -hmm. So you use them as a tool. They are not sacred. So mm. if you use it and it works, great. And you should test it and push it and prod it. But the moment it doesn't work, throw it out. Figure it out, like what the actual mm. question is. And so then you're not faithful to a theory just because you're faithful to it. And that was one of the best things I was ever taught because it, it really opened up the kinds of research questions that I'm willing to ask because I'm not feeling like I have to do it within optimality theory or within like rule based theories or like I'm not having to argue about X bar versus minimalist syntax versus whatever, like I'm able to just go, okay, so there's this framework and let's see mm -hmm. if it works and we can take this piece of it and this piece of it and zombie together something that's actually explaining what we're seeing and then see what's going on elsewhere. Like, so Adam and I think very similarly in this. Yeah. It sounds like you're both like pick and mix. Um, yeah. Lingu in, when it comes to linguistic theory, do you think that's um, the the future of the field? Do you think that, once maybe more of the older generation is is uh, maybe retiring and the new ones are uh, in the tenured professorships, that would be a more common thing? Or do you think that there are young people today that really keep this conflict alive? Even if it's sociological, you both touch on this fact that it seems like some of it is a scientific conflict and some of it seems to be a sociological conflict, just like inheritance, religion, where you grew up. Well, yeah, I think that it is certainly a lesser conflict in our generation of researchers, or perhaps I'm in an echo chamber of my own making, um, where a lot of people who are in our generation are much less committed to these big conflicts and more committed to trying to be more ethical, more scientific, um, implementing interdisciplinary approaches, so taking theory but compare but adding computational analysis, fieldwork analysis, neurological analysis, like trying to find the psychological reality of what we're talking about in terms of theories as opposed to just talking about it. Um, and so you'll find that a lot of us are not disagreeing with each other very much about that. I think that where we have differences, and Adam may think of this um, in a different way, but people who choose to work primarily in field work and community-based research versus theoretical, like I feel like I'm less of a weird breed of linguist by doing both now, but at the time that I started, no one knew what to do with me. <laughs> um, because a lot of the advisors were like, why, like, why would you do that? And I was like, why wouldn't you do that? Like, and so it was a fundamental change in thinking. And I think that that is happening, like in a generational sense. And we're starting to see that showing up in a real way because we're now in professor and postdoc and, and these early career positions that have us in the hierarchy, so to speak. So like we're, we're functioning within academia primarily. And so academia is a, the abusive partner that I will never leave kind of thing where there's Ooh. toxicity, there's hierarchy, there's a lot of these norms that you follow. And a lot of the younger generation is going enough. Like, I don't have to believe you just because you're 65 and tenured. Like, 
I get to question those ideas. I get to question those theories. I get to throw them out and start over and show you why, because I'm smart enough to do it. So there's a lot of discussion that comes from that. There's a not very happy people about this. Um, and it can involve a backlash right now. And we've seen it a lot in the public sphere where it's not necessarily a question of generativism, but just age. So like, you know, I had, that's why I had sent you guys the email before we recorded in the fact that the backlash to the open letter to the LSA, which I know you guys have talked about on the podcast, it, it exemplifies this change that's happening in the field where younger people are saying no. And it's not just younger people. It's just a majority younger people going, I refuse to let this be what academia is. I refuse to let this be what linguistics is. Like, I don't want to be perceived. I go to conferences all the time. And when I'm at a conference that's not primarily generative, I don't want to be perceived as the evil one in the room. Like, <laughs> I, I try very hard to not be. And there's a history here um, that is showing that it is very inherently classist, racist, it, like all of sexist, like it has been and, and is. And the younger generation is like, I think we can do this and not be those things. So mm -hmm. let's try that. And so it is changing, I think, but it's going to have some growing pains because the the just the age of the field of generativism is young, right? Like we're talking about the people who did this are still working. Like they're mm -hmm. starting to retire, but these, the old guard are still here. And so there's a lot of clashes happening right now. Um, and I think that it'll, it'll shift generally like, um, like with anything, it's a slow moving process. This is a fun shift from the ending uh, of one of our previous conversations with John Goldsmith, which was um, that young people should. Um, young people should you know. listen to the older generation more. That's, I mean, like young it's people, a little bit what he said. Let me grab my microphone. Not, young people don't. <laughs> he he has wild. a little bit of a point. It's, it's good to not like throw everything out with the bathwater, surely. No, it's true. To sort of I, defend him slightly, I think. Yeah. What, what he's done a lot of research into the history of linguistics in the history of linguistics is that he noticed that generative linguists, he thinks they've tossed out a lot of good ideas from the structuralists. And he's True. sort of like feeling, he's feeling, oh, that's gonna he's, yeah, that they toss, again. Yeah, 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 that he thinks that's, he think I think he universalizes it a little bit too much. I think maybe there was something very special in the history of linguistics that made those specific generativists a little bit too enthusiastic. I yeah. did start reading his new book and yeah. I agree. The yeah. history of the field is incredibly important Yeah, because you carry it with you. Right. So I think that's what he, he, he was specifically, that's where he's coming from. Um, and I think maybe he's trying to apply it to the current generation, but I would kind of push back on this a little bit because there's a huge difference between the way the field is in the 60s and right now. One, linguistics is much more institutionalized. So okay. he's talking about me not forgetting all the things that the previous generations learned about. But I, the curriculum is developed in such a way that I was forced to sit in classes where these things were driven into my head over and over and over again. <laughs> I don't, that really wasn't true in the 60s um, to the same degree. Uh, I don't think there were classes on learning discovery procedures. At least <laughs> pr Professor Wolfert never told me. There were, I don't think Chomsky ever took a course called behaviorism. And I just don't think that happened. So what's, and, and then the other difference is, is that in the United States in particular, the university system was expanding, right? So it was much easier to uh, disagree with your, with your elders um, because you could get a job easily. <sighs> with the younger generation, it's much harder because the job market in linguistics and academia in general has contracted to a large degree. And right. so we're super dependent on the older generation to give us positions, even if we think they're pig headed and attached to debates that happened in the 1970s that we no longer think are relevant. It's true. It's worth noting that Adam and I are not in tenure track positions and it's a hard job market. And I have been shortlisted for several tenure track positions and have been turned down for seemingly stupid reasons. 
And it's like it's a it's a luck thing if you get the tenure track position yeah. really at this point. Crucially, though, I, I it just was not like that in the 60s and 70s. No. I'm sorry. Like it was Ger- Gerald Sadock. I, I mean, I saw a talk given by John Goldsmith and Gerald Sadock at the University of Chicago talking about how they how they got into linguistics. And Gerald Sadock was like, well, I don't know. I was thinking of doing chemistry and I was just hanging out. And then the University of Chicago called me and gave me a job. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Can that happen I to spend, me? Yeah, I <laughs> I spend a month organizing an application and then get rejected from like thirteen jobs and so on and so forth. I have a strong publication record, so it's not. I'm not. You know, I'm not saying I that mean, there's yeah. some good things about this. Maybe there's maybe we we won't forget what the the older generation said before because we can't. So at least there's that. But on the other <laughs> hand, they're safeguarding the jobs. Yeah. On the other hand. I, this is one of the reasons I sort of would push back against what John Goldsmith is saying. I don't think we're going to forget what the previous generation has been saying. Okay. I think that was something very specific about the historical error. I think we're not in danger of that at all. Yeah, I think that was something very specific about the era he grew up in. And he realized this happened now. And he's writing books about how they, you know, they lost mm-hmm. a lot of insights from the prior generation. I think if anything, the new generation is like, yeah, of course not. We're going to look at old structuralist arguments and yeah. and other functional uh, functionalist arguments and and really try to find something that is working here um but yeah there's a yeah. difference between forgetting and not opposing mm-hmm. um, right you can right. you can remember and and appreciate um what people have done before you but still uh, question it i think daniel's signaling that um uh, it's been very lovely to talk to you all but that we are uh running maybe a bit over time so we need to think of a good way of wrapping it up you're going to have to probably do quite a bit of cutting. <laughs> I, To be honest, I really do not know if I would want to cut anything because this has been such an incredible conversation, but... It's a bit longer than what we usually do. <laughs> but, Sorry um, that we're both talkative. <laughs> so good. What an incredible conversation with Dr. Taylor Miller and Dr. Adam Tallman. Thanks to both of you for giving us your perspective and where you're coming from. I learned so much from you. So thank you so much. It was great being here. And uh, I, I do love the podcast now that I know about it. And I will be listening to you uh, moving forward. I'm really excited. Excellent. Thanks very much for inviting me. It was, it was great. But you're not done yet because it's time for Words of the Week. And I believe... Linguistic Capitalism. Dr. Taylor Miller, you have brought us... Oh, yes. ...a word. Well, it's technically a phrase. I feel like I should clarify that. Um, We've so... used many phrases for Word of the Week. Word of the Week mm-hmm. is just the loosiest, goosiest yes. possible definition. So my <laughs> Word of the Week is um, is out of pocket because it's undergoing a change in meaning currently um and i know that because i was watching tiktok and i instantly aged 50 years because i didn't understand what was being said and um, (laughs) and so this is a very gen z thing that is starting um from what i can tell so out of pocket is now meaning um it's no longer like i used to use it as like oh am i out of pocket like am i completely on a different planet here like i'm totally not following oh, what's happening that's not how oh. i use it at all no Me neither, no really? not at all. and now it's more like speaking out of your ass or whatever like if you're just making it up and flying by the seat of your pants you're you're like i'm not out of pocket i know what i'm talking about like no. that's oh what's gosh. being done yeah and so i saw this all the time on tiktok they'd be like tell me if I'm out of pocket or I'm not out of pocket. I know what I'm doing. Or like, he's so out of pocket. He's, he's so, and I'm like, like, what is that? And it's, it's like out of line. Yeah. This is the most interesting thing I've heard. Can I tender a guess? What if, and I'm also going to age myself right now because I am trying to come (laughs) up with like a homebrew theory to explain how the youth are using language. But um, (laughs) do you think that it might be like my personal experience of having observed many teenagers is that when someone starts doing something seriously banane uh phones come out right to record what's going on right like when something yeah. genuinely hectic or crazy is going down <laughs> teenagers film it it's like right it is a deeply ingrained process do you reckon they mean that 
Yes. Like you are behaving so randomly that I am pulling no. my phone out I of my pocket. I feel like it's a phone. new version of extra, which also broke me when that first started being a thing because I was, I was 27 or something. And it was like, I went to sleep one night and I woke up the next <laughs> morning and I was old because somebody like people started saying like, Oh, that don't be extra. That's so extra. And I had to <laughs> ask my friend, I said, hello, you're young. And she goes, please stop talking. And I said, I need to ask this question. I said, extra what? I feel like we're missing a word there. Um, being extra what? And she goes, no, Taylor, it's just extra. And I'm like, help, you know? Um, and so I feel like the out of pocket thing is, uh, it's very new from what I can see. Um, and I love it. Like I'm, I'm trying to figure it out and I'll probably okay. use it once I figure out how to use it properly. You won't though, because you'll use it near a person from Gen Z and you, and yeah. they'll just be like, no, no. Yeah, they're going to be like, no, no Dr. Miller, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because Gen Z would definitely use the honorific doctor. <laughs> My students would. <laughs> <laughs> ben, can you tell us what your understanding of out-of-pocket is? Oh, I've always understood out-of-pocket to basically mean uh, unaccounted for expense. Like, yes. um, yeah. you, know, you know, like I've been cruising around the streets uh, and I bought a bunch of stuff and now I'm out of pocket, like 30 bucks or whatever. Yeah. Or like it's it's unreasonable to demand that young scholars pay for their own uh, travel to conferences because that's an out of pocket expense. Oh, I have that meaning, too, as well. But I've never heard of either of the meanings Taylor brought up. So that was very fun. <laughs> Thank you. OK, well, um, I'm just looking at Green's Dictionary of Slang, Green's Dict of Slang dot com. And it looks like there is a, uh, a version of this phrase out of pocket or out of the pocket, which comes from black American English. And it means acting in an unacceptable or tasteless manner. Right. Wow. So it's probably not new in black English, but it yep. is new to the, the white people on the as internet. As with all cool <laughs> lingo, it has just been shamelessly stolen from black folks. Yes, totally. but thank again. you because I love the phrase and I'm, I'm hoping to learn it. <laughs> That's great. Okay, this one comes from Nikolai on our Discord channel. I think that we're all in favor of people from other disciplines doing work in linguistics. There's no problem there. Some of our very favorite guests and researchers are not linguists. Then there's another with tendency. Some yeah, yeah. With some... <laughs> I feel a big hairy butt making its way onto the field. <laughs> but there's another tendency for people who come from other fields. For some reason, it's often economics. They try to use language data to prove an idea that they have, and it's often a misguided idea that regular people find very attractive, but that linguists have worked very hard to disabuse people of. And then when these non-linguists are corrected by linguists, what they do is they dismiss the linguists, they double down on their ideas, and then they cry that they're being bullied. So <clears throat> the term that I learned for this tendency uh, from a tweet from Joshua Rayclaw is epistemic trespassing. The idea that you're working outside of your area, but not just that, but that you're dismissing experts in the area, you're coming up with your own views and doing it badly. That's what do you a real think? Thing. It's a real thing. I agree. I think it's a real thing. I like the term because yeah. it, it allows me to just define what's happening as opposed to just getting irrationally mad or rationally mad. I, I, yeah. I don't think it's irrational, actually. Too gatekeepy? Maybe. It could I, easily become gatekeeping. Yeah. Well, um, I think that the epistemic trespasser is the gatekeeper often. Like they've declared huh. themselves the gatekeeper. I would like to tender an alternative, uh, mill housing, right? Because <laughs> because epistemic uh, trespass has a real sort of judgy vibe, right? Like you've you've been like, don't come on my lawn. It's got a real like, you get off my lawn. Whereas mill housing just describes a humongous dweeby baby who tried a thing and now is like hell whingy about it. We're talking about Millhouse from The Simpsons. Simpsons. Popular yeah, of American. Yeah, which episode? I can see that. All of them. Oh, Millhouse is just a lot regularly the awful like person who no one wants around the whole time. Okay. But he's not claiming things about things outside of his knowledge base that often. Oh no, he? there are many episodes where he tries to like oh. flex and fails. I really don't like the term epistemic trespassing. I have to admit. 
I think it's. Okay. I find it a bit clunky. <laughs> I think well, it's not just clunky. It's got a very neoliberal ideology underlying it that like <laughs> that's true even your knowledge is like your property as an academic it just don't or that some domain of study is your property it's just kind of gross i think that you can venture into different areas of study and not be this though like that's mm. always the goal right sure. is to say yeah. this is not my typical wheelhouse but it is, am I wrong? Am I out of pocket to say am I being a mill X, house Y, Z? Right <laughs> yeah. um, and yeah. if you come in from that perspective, I think most people are willing to listen to you. It's when you come in and declare yourself an expert in something that you've not put in the time. So I don't think it's necessarily gatekeepy as much as like be respectful um, mm. and remember where fields have come from. Like I had, I've had to do this like, you don't have to like put in your time necessarily, but you have to take the time to recognize what people have said, what the active conversation is, and then add to it as opposed to reinventing the wheel. What about yeah. something that, that takes on the metaphor of disguise, like charading as something? Was, is that a word? Is that how that yeah, works? Like masquerading um, as Masquerading. As there we go. Masquerading. Yeah. I still like millhousing. I still like okay. it. Okay. Yeah, it's I because think everyone it's a better word, but Ben just did went very interesting. You just is he looking funny to you guys as well? He's frozen. Uh uh. Hmm. This this is internet Perth internet. I'm gonna defend Perth internet, but where'd okay. he go? Ben, we lost you. I'll continue on with this. I do. I do. Um, you know, you get frustrated when people talk about something maybe you've you've thought about it a lot more and you feel like they shouldn't be imposing their view on you so strongly but i also kind of think this is our public responsibility as academics i think that kind of comes with the terrain and so this actually might depend on where you are excluding um lecturers in the united states where they're paid complete shit wages and are literally totally proletarianized academics are um are, are sort of you know, pretty privileged overall. And I think it's part of our public responsibility to be patient with people and, and explain things to them in a way that, uh, in a way that is like not condescending. So that's kind of one of my reasons for not liking that. Yeah. On the other hand, often the people who are doing the epistemic trespassing aren't working class people and they're, they're, uh, they're the most privileged people. So there's that, there's right. that dynamic to it. So, um, I think I'm just going to stick with um, the term uh, being a huge dick. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what good. I tell I tell everybody. Yeah. I was like, my life philosophy is to just not be a racist dick. So yeah. if you do that, <laughs> then you're probably pretty good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> mm. Next one. This one comes from Aristeno on our Discord channel. Tattleware. This uh, comes from an article by Sandy Milne in The Guardian. Bosses turn to tattleware to keep tabs on employees working from home. Yes. I do not have a lot of experience with this, but what have y'all noticed? I'm reading a book right now by Roland Paulson called Empty Labor, which is about what people do in their work time that isn't work. Uh, he explicitly excludes academics because they're too hard to define what work is. <laughs> so he's just like, mess. I'm yeah. not going to interview any academics, which makes sense. Uh, and I found out very interesting stats that, for example, there was a study uh, of internet traffic to porn sites in the United States and that 60% of the internet traffic to porn sites is between the hours of between nine to five, suggesting that a lot of people are watching mm -hmm. porn on their work time. Wow. And uh, this book goes on to explore many reasons why people might be doing things that aren't work. Maybe they can also go on. Another thing a lot of people do apparently is go on like Amazon and shop or do personal errands or stuff. And there are many reasons why people might be doing this. One people, Some people could say it's sabotaging their employer. Other people say it's reclaiming uh, time that has been colonized by work. Um, there are, it's a long discussion. I really recommend this book, by the way. But it, it has... It has um, meant that some employers have installed Tattleware, which is surveillance programs that monitor, for example, which websites uh, you uh, you visit or what you do on your computer for people who work on computers in the work time. There are also softwares that measure like it's like if your mouse moves. So like mm. if you're working from home, it's checking that your mouse is active 
or yeah. that you're actively typing something every once in a while. And it's awful. Like, I yeah. actually really like the word for it because it is that. It's tattling. And it's like your workforce will be more effective if they just they just get the work done. Like, you don't need to police how it happens. You just need to police that it happens. Yeah. But for some, some, for example, there was in the Swedish news very recently, a man who used over 50 hours, he was working for the tax office and on calling, and he spent over 50 hours calling his own mobile phone. Um, so in those instances, <laughs> calling is okay. the work. But you know what, if, if you're going to commit that hard, I'm kind of just impressed, you know, like, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, or, or calling family members is another thing. So um, for, for some employees or some employers, the work that you're being paid for is easier to quantify than in other places, right? Um, so in academics, you can say like, are you publishing enough? Are you teaching enough? Are you whatever? Um, but for some people, it's like, how many calls are you making? And I think those are the workplaces that install most Tableware. Right. So is it, hold on. Is it a software or is it a, just a class of types of softwares? Like, what is it? It's a class of software. There's different oh, ones. There's I a bunch. So, so basically, it's any like any management tool that's monitoring people and trying to keep track of the seconds. Yeah. Yeah, like if you're if you're in like a call center, oftentimes, uh, like especially with the pandemic, with people transitioning to work from home, this has become more prevalent because they want to make sure that you're actually earning your money. Um, but it becomes really restrictive because the whole benefit of working from home is that you can take a break. <laughs> like mm. you can go take a nap and still come back and get the work done. But these softwares are put into place so that you do not do that. It, it reminds me uh. of this movie. Has anyone seen o the movie Office Space? Yeah, it is yeah. frequently exactly. referenced in the book. The, OK, <laughs> OK, good. Yeah. The, 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 where they it's basically the guy basically spends only about 15 minutes actually working. And it also right. reminds me of that book by David Graeber, Bullshit Jobs, which is mm -hmm. a good book, who's mm -hmm. basically arguing that we've created jobs where people don't really have to do anything. And it's just mm -hmm. um, and they don't have any public function. Uh, yep. And uh, so, yeah, naturally, you'd, you'd spend your time looking at pornography, which I guess is more meaningful. Than whatever yeah, I guess doing. we could just bash capitalism yeah. for a while, but yeah, yeah it's true. No, reading this yeah. book, like one of the chief complaints people have is that they don't find their work meaningful and that's yeah. why they're doing other things. So, I mean, yeah. right. Anyway, I, Tidalware is a good term. I see also that Glyph on Discord uh, nominated as well Stalkerware, which is a bit more disturbing. So this is yeah. where... Stalkerware. Um, yeah, it's yeah. like when you yeah. install an app on your girlfriend's phone without her knowing, and it tells you where she is at all times mm. and what phone calls she's making. Or keyboard trackers on a desktop. Yeah, Jesus. which is not cool. Don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely do not do I mean, that. Don't do any of these things. Don't do mm. Tidalware. Don't do Stalkerware. People talk about doing that as parents, and I'm like, or talk oh. to the children oh wow you know yeah. just an idea yeah those are the yeah, worst yeah, stories yeah. okay let's go on to one suggested again by diego on patreon he says hey this is a new word for me scrometing i hate this one just a quick announcement ben ben has dropped off the call and he's lost power in his building so he he conveys his support for the rest of the conversation scrometing <laughs> This comes from NBC News in the USA. The article is High Potency Weed Linked to Psychotic Episodes, Mysterious Vomiting Illness in Young Users. The condition, officially called cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome, but now known to healthcare workers as scrometing, a mashup of screaming and vomiting, has popped up with increasing frequency at hospitals in Colorado, doctors say. This is terrible. You're just trying to enjoy some weed. It's simultaneously hilarious because it's about <laughs> weed and yes. awful because that's a horrible blend i hate it it's icky i don't ah. like saying it and it's also a gross concept <laughs> i hate vomiting i think it's the worst i would think it was hilarious except for the fact that the poor er workers have to oh deal yeah with for sure this. like i'm sure it's a pain i had heard greening out for that like oh if you really green out it's that you've smoked too much weed yeah. and you'll get sick. Yeah, that's the word I would know, yeah, to green out. Um, yeah. But I suppose oh, wow. that this is just a new word for that. Yeah, you just puke okay. and stuff. 
Yeah. But you're supposed to. Is, are you as, as well? As in, yeah, I never heard of that with weed. I that couldn't understand like... that if it's like you're screaming, but like, isn't that just projectile vomiting? <laughs> oh, sure. <laughs> I feel like it's. I don't know. I don't get <laughs> they're this. They're vomiting line. so and... much that it's like they're screaming. Yeah, huh. I don't know. But I, I saw I saw this written and I went, ew, no, ew. ew but, okay, move so on. <laughs> is it is it like Colorado? This is popping up in Colorado. Marijuana it's been is legal legalized there. there for a long yeah. time. Yeah. So so yeah. That we know it's in the weed that they're smoking. So um, I guess so. So Colorado listeners get better weed. Is that what you're saying? I, I don't I don't know. It's just is this too much THC or what the heck? I, because I I've wish never for heard you of this. Coloradans that you get better weed. That's what I wish. It's my, my no, but I think maybe you, I maybe guess. become because it became legal. People were able to like choose the highest potency weed they possibly could, and so overdoses. Whereas maybe. when I was a kid back in the day, you'd go down and you'd have to buy it from some sketchy person, and it would be mostly oregano, and <laughs> you, <laughs> you'd still get a little high, but. <laughs> You, you're not gonna green out. You're not gonna scream. Yeah. At the very least, <laughs> no scrumming. Yeah. Check out this pull quote from the article. Bo Gribben, twenty years old, went to the ER eleven times in nine months for a condition that causes nonstop bouts of vomiting and screaming. Um, you know, eleven times. <laughs> wouldn't you? I mean, wouldn't you work it out? Ah, this is going to change nothing about my behavior. <laughs> Poor yeah. person. I don't get that. Like, I feel bad for him. I mean, maybe they're going through some depressive. Like, maybe there's a good reason for using that much weed. Yeah, if you're life, using if you're using cannabis me- medicinally, but it's making you sicker, perhaps don't do that. Yeah. But after the sixth ER visit, wouldn't you put it together? I would think. I don't know. Maybe. Anyway, but that if- led me to think about what other bodily portmanteaus we need. I once made a chart of cough, sneeze, fart shit and uh vomit well i mean shart is a great one shart is classic we know that shart exists we also know that verp exists yeah excuse me one more time vomit verp. and burp verp verp verp, verp. vomit and v. burp you... isn't that just verp. acid With reflux a... yeah i mean okay. yes repeating on okay. you yes but the important thing about a portmanteau is that both parts of it are kind of clear and i think shart and verp are very successful because the, they are etymologically transparent. Yeah, they're, they're intuitive. is not obvious to me. No. <laughs> like it sounds like vomiting and scrotum. Yeah. <laughs> Which is not what we want. Or like ever. Scrum. No. Like a scrum. No. Yeah. <laughs> I'm that, trying when to I saw imagine it the what that is. I thought and it was I'm... a scrum, like a rugby scrum. Mm. Oh. Oh. Scrum. But, um, yeah, I have getting one together. That I, think, I, I would have I think... guessed it had something to do with getting your scrotum crushed. Obviously, we need a word for that. So, mm. Mm. I okay, guess get on okay. it. Uh, get Crunk, on it, social crushing. media. Make, mm. make the new blends. Crushing. Scrushing. Scrushing. <laughs> mm-hmm. I think I've talked on the show before about one that like exists in Swedish as an example of a portmanteau, but I've never heard anyone use, which is grunka, grunka, which is like crying and masturbating. Oh. We have that in Winnipeg. Oh. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> well, obviously, criterbating is is something that. But except in Winnipeg, you also have to be holding a beer, so it's a little different. Oh, that's, that's multitasking. Mm. <laughs> yeah, but I don't think that was widely used. It was just something with my high school. Is there one for is there one for crying and eating at the same time? Because that's a common thing that people talk about. But I don't know. So the word that came up in the 2016 was Kummerspeck a German loan, and it meant grief bacon. But that refers to the extra weight that you might put on after a bout of emotional eating. I think emotional eating. Well, now we just call that pandemic weight. (laughs) Yeah, no, that's that's a different thing. But um, No, it's different. I thought people use comfort eating for that, but you're right. It'd be fun if there was a a portmanteau. Yeah, if there was a portmanteau, I think that we would all really latch on to that. But I can't think Mm -hmm. of one that would sound right. Well, I don't know if we've made any headway, but maybe our listeners will be able to help us. As it is, we've got out-of-pocket, epistemic trespassing or millhousing, tattleware, and scrummeting <laughs> are words of the week. Dr. Taylor Miller and Dr. Adam Tallman, thank you so much for joining us on our show today. It's been amazing. Thanks so much, guys. Thanks very much.
Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening to this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. If you have any comments about what we've said or you want to contradict us or you're just very angry and you want to let us know or you're very happy and you want to let us know, you can get in touch with us. We are Because Lang Pod on every conceivable social platform. You know the ones. Facebook, Twitter, blah, 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 blah. But also, hello at becauselanguage.com is a good way to reach us. Now, if you'd like to help the show, please give us a review in all the reviewy places. Tell a friend about us. Dustin of Sandman Stories is very good at recommending us to lots and lots of people on Twitter. And if you can do those things, then it'll help people find us, which is what we want. And we would like to send a special thanks to all of our lovely patrons on Patreon, or our lovely patrons on Patreon. This is a struggle for you every right. podcast. First they're time. Called patrons oh my gosh. And on Patreon. Um, yes, they we are. love you guys. And because of them, we can do things like make episodes and release them for free. So anyone who isn't a patron should send, uh, you know, well wishes to those that are. We can also make transcripts. And it means that our shows are accessible for people who can't listen or who don't want to listen for whatever reason. And our shows are searchable. So if you want to know which episode we said scrometing in, you can find find that out um it was this one it was this one um if you're not yet uh a patron but you enjoy our show consider giving us some money we we try and do good things with it uh and special shout outs to our top patrons who are dustin termy chris b chris l matt whitney damien helen bob udo jack kitty lord mortis elias michael larry Christopher, Andy, Mai, James, Nigel, Kate, Jen, Nazrin, River, Nikolai, Aisha, Moe, Steele, Andrew, Manu, James, Roger, Rian, Jonathan, Colleen, Glyph, Ignacio, Kevin, Jeff, Dave, H, Andy from Logophilius, Samantha, Zoe, Kathy, Raj, and the wonderful Kate B. Thanks to all of you. Not so fast. We've got some even newer supporters. They are Diana, Cheyenne, and Felicity. Thanks so much to all of you. You know that great theme music you're listening to right now? Well, that had to come from a human. And that human is Drew Kreplyanov, who's a member of Ryan Bino and of Didion's Bible. Thanks for listening. We'll catch you next time. Because language. Because language. Because language. Because language.